I want to talk about geothermal, but perhaps not the type of geothermal that most people think about. There's what I call local geothermal, geothermal in buildings. This is a picture of a hospital being built in Illinois. Uh, they have actually used a bulldozer made an artificial lake uh, nearby, and this lake in the Midwest uh, is expected to have a constant temperature. It's about 15 feet deep of perhaps 55 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year. And so this, what the piping you see are water piping, and by using this lake as a heat reservoir, they can more efficiently cool in the summer and heat in the winter. The expectation is that this geothermal, using the Earth's constant temperature as a, as a t uh, thermal source, uh, they expect to reduce the energy bills by as much as a million dollars a year. Payback period, the hospital claims, will be a quote a few short years. Uh, this is can be done not only within, in large buildings like hospitals, but it also can be done in homes. Uh, we have to get the message out that a few thousand dollar additional investment in a geothermal home will again pay back, depending on where you are, but let's say it's in the Midwest in probably five or six years, uh, other places more. Because if you have both large heating and air conditioning bills, uh, this is a very good thing. The heat pump, which, which cools in the summertime and heats in the winter time is much more effective than gas heating in the winter and air conditioning in the summer. Um, what are some of the other things? We have to transform the way we do transportation, in particular personal transportation. Um, here you see a plot of the energy density, that energy per unit volume on the y-axis, energy per unit weight on the <coughs> x-axis. And leading list, so if you're up there in the high upper right hand corner is where you have the highest density fuel. That's where, that's ideal for transportation. And you see leading list is diesel, kerosene, gasoline, and body fat. Uh, body fat's very important because it, there's a reason why nature actually chose to store energy in terms of body fat. That's the highest density. It wasn't uh, an aesthetic uh, decision. <laughs> it's the highest density of energy storage you can muster. And so rather than storing carbohydrates, it chooses in fat. Uh, so now down in that list of things, of the liquid fuels are up in the upper right-hand corner. Down in the lower left-hand corner, which is barely off zero axis in energy density, is the lithium-ion battery. So you can look at this and say, well, it's hopeless. How are we going to electrify our automobile fleet? Well, it's not hopeless. It's because the internal combustion engine is a lot heavier than an electric motor. And it's a lot more in energy inefficient than an electric motor. And so if we can develop a battery that can last 5,000 deep discharges, uh, something on the order of the lifetime of the car, 15 years, and has two megajoules of uh, energy storage, per, megajoules per kilogram, that corresponds to about 600 watt hours per kilogram. That's where that little red star is. Uh, that will electrify the automobile industry. The good news is we're going to get halfway there, I think, within several years. And whether we can get all the way there, it depends on things. But we see in the horizon, the immediate horizon, uh, something that's at least double the energy density. The longevity is also a very crucial issue. And we're not there yet. But again, I know of some startup companies, some uh, people in laboratories who are at least in test prototypes getting there. So that's good news. Um, agricultural biofuels. Uh, what is the role of biofuels? Well, first, there's a tremendous amount of agricultural waste. Wheat straw, rice straw, corn cobs, things of that nature where it's essentially burned, buried, or left to, left to rot. Uh, it's uh, used for animal bedding, but we don't need all that for animal bedding by a long shot. And so the hope is to convert the agricultural waste, the lumber waste, the wood chips, all the excess uh, debris that we uh, use in our normal processes into biofuels. In addition to that, we want to develop crops that don't compete with fuel, with food, crops that require far less, or essentially no fertilizer, just as this uh, crop, this is a Macanthus plot in, off the University of Illinois. That's uh, 14 feet high of grass that grew without irrigation and without fertilizer. And then you harvest it that year, next year it grows back. Because in the 
autumn time, the nutrients are pulled back down into the roots. And so much of the energy input in terms of fertilizer and plowing and all these other things are avoided. Um, in order to break down this lignocellulose into biofuels, um, we, the first pass of course to make ethanol, but ethanol is not the ideal fuel. Uh, some DOE sponsored researchers have already converted yeast and some E. coli by putting entire metabolic pathways into these organisms so that when fed simple sugars, uh, this, the organisms, the yeast, can create not ethanol but um, diesel-like and gasoline-like fuel. So that's been already done. The question is, can we actually get the output of the yeast up to scale? And, but it, since it only, the good news is it only took six months to do this. Uh, and so hopefully we'll see, but hopefully in, in several years we can, we can do that. There should be new approaches to nuclear power. I personally feel that nuclear power has to be part of the mix of this century. Uh, because it is carbon free and it is baseload. I, I believe the nuclear reactors are uh, much safer than designs today. Uh, and so what are the issues? The issues are, are, are they going to be economical, number one, and if, if they're designed properly, we hope so. Um, the other thing is waste. I, I think the nuclear waste issue is a solvable problem. Uh, we know a lot more than the United States knew 25 years ago uh, when we wrote a nuclear waste act. Uh, to my mind, a more serious problem, which we will require international collaboration, is um, uh, non-proliferation. Once you have nuclear reactors, uh, you could have, uh, you have the option possibly of turning some of that into some bomb material, and this is a very important issue. But uh, I think, again, that's solvable. Okay, finally, uh, no, not finally, but carbon captured storage. Um, if you look, the United States has 25% of the world's uh, coal, if you look at the countries China, US, Russia, Australia, and India, those countries have 75% of the coal reserves. And I don't think uh, those countries will turn their back on coal. So we think it's very important to, to try to develop clean ways of using coal, which means capture and sequester for long periods of time the carbon. We're serious about this. The United States, through the Department of Energy, has invested four billion dollars uh, in CCS. This is in the Recovery Act. We're, we're, we're making uh, these grants now. Uh, there's, it's been matched by an additional seven billion dollars of private sector money in the U.S. So this is a substantial down payment on looking for a solution. We're also uh, funding eight billion dollars with the loan guarantees. Our goal is very aggressive. We would like to drive down the cost of this technology so that within eight or ten years you can allow commercial deployment. Whether this happens or not, I, I don't know, but this is our goal. Beyond that, we are also investing in more research that goes well beyond the, the technologies we're beginning to pilot today. And again, to drive down the cost so that uh, not only the United States and Europe can, uh, can do this, but countries like China and India will also begin to use carbon capture and sequestration. We need to improve energy storage because renewable energy uh, is variable. The wind stops blowing, the sun stops shining. And so uh, I show in the upper right hand corner a picture of what we call pump storage. That up in the top there's this little holding pond, what I call a holding pond, a very small fraction of the volume uh, of the lake where the dam is. And when the wind is blowing at night and you can't use the power, you use that energy to pump water up a hill. Then on the daytime, you can, when you need the power, you, you uh, let it come back down, you generate energy. The total round trip time, the energy it takes to pump the water up the hill, even including evaporation loss when it's up there, versus the power you generate coming down, the round trip efficiency is between 70 and 85% efficient. Uh, I just came from Norway, and Norway has great hydro resources, and they're very serious about developing their hydro resources for pump storage, not only for Norway, but for a large part of Europe. Again, as we go to more solar, more wind, once you get to 20, 25% and beyond, you have to have some means of storing that energy. 